Okay, so we started thinking about how do I see the world? And I'm suggesting that you holding an awareness of how I see the world can be very helpful to understanding how you act in the world. So what I want to go on to now is to say how do we act in the world? What is our worldview? And I want to put a question really, is there a prevailing worldview, especially in the Anglo-Saxon Western world? And I would say, is that worldview actually slowly, largely through the language of English, beginning to permeate most of the world? And I argue that yes, there is a prevailing way of seeing the world, a prevailing worldview. And it, it is a very, very powerful one, and it holds enormous sway. And I'll, I'll try and illustrate what I mean by that. I'm going to illustrate it with a little bit of history. But first of all, what is this worldview? Well, I call it the mechanistic. That's my overall name for it. That we live in a time where the prevailing worldview is mechanistic, machine-based. It's also reductionist, dualist, uh, sorry, these, it sounds as though I'm using these terms in a kind of insulting way. I'm not at all. They're just, they're, I'm going to sound a bit more neutral because it's not my intention to be judging this worldview. In fact, it's got immense uses, but it is, I think, nonetheless, a very definite worldview. So mechanistic, reductionist, dualistic, scientific, and it uses for its metaphors the metaphors of machines and what I'll broadly call Newtonian physics. And I'll try and explain what I mean by that a bit more later on. So I just want to take you back in time now to say, to, because I think it helps somehow to have a sense of where this prevailing worldview comes from and why it's got such a grip on us and why I think it's, got some very serious and pervasive consequences that systems thinking is seeking to shift. Um, but that's for later on. So historically, and we're talking now before the mid-1500s really, there was in the world something that you might describe as an anima mundi. It, it varied, but there was a very strong religious sense that Mother Earth in some way had, had a soul, if you like, that there was a, a kind of a spirit to the earth. It wasn't, it wasn't as we tend to see it now. And this was very much in Europe, was very much uh, held in place by the teachings of the church. Um, the creation story says that, you know, the earth is there for us to have dominion over it. Um, and that we are essentially the, the chosen species and we live at the center of the universe. So every day the sun would come up and light us. And I think I'm, yeah, something like that actually. Sun would come up and light us all day and then go down. And there was a whole mythology existed about how the sun in the night got from over there to over there so that it could come up again. And then come, comes along Copernicus, and soon after him Galileo, confirming what Copernicus said with his telescope, and various other famous names, Kepler, and I'm going to go through a few of them now. But Copernicus said, we're wrong. The sun does not go round us, we go round it. I, I think I'd like to kind of take you back. This is, can you imagine, I can't sort of think of an equivalent now of such a massive shift in worldview. The worldview was, we are the center of the universe, the sun goes round us. And Copernicus and others come along and say, I want you to fundamentally shift that worldview. I want you to turn it inside out and see it the other way around, that we're going round the sun. And I, I, you know, it's just, well, I suppose climate change is a bit like that. We're asking people now to accept climate change and many people just can't. 
And there were leading intellectuals of the day at Copernicus's time who, who said things like, well, it's all very well for your mathematics to tell us that we're going round the sun, but just look out of the window. You can see with the evidence of your own eyes that the sun is going round us. And that's really the key to it, because what happened at this point in history is we can no longer trust the evidence of our own eyes. And this is a hugely significant moment. And it gives birth to the idea that knowledge is based on expert input. Somebody knows about this thing, they've studied it, they've got empirical, objective evidence that tells them that this is how it is. And so we get the birth of the scientific method of empiricism. And Bacon, Francis Bacon in this country, was the father of empiricism. He invented the methodology. He came a little bit later because following hard on the heels of Copernicus and Galileo, we had Descartes. And Descartes was studying the whole relationship of man with what was around you know, the earth and so on. And he was concluding by looking at animals and others that the distinctive capability of human beings is that we think. And this is unique to us. And he felt that our conscious, rational thinking method is unique to us as a species. And this was our special gift from God, a deep, deeply religious man. He said this, um, cog cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. So my whole existence is born of the fact that I'm a thinking being. Unlike all those animals that just don't think, they just live the life of beasts. We've got different views about that now, but that's how it was seen at the time. And he was also saying that the universe was a machine and that it worked like a clock. And many others were saying something similar at the same time. They were beginning to measure the movement of the stars and seeing lots of regularity and patterns. And the whole thing began to have a sense of machine about it. As a backdrop to this, for the previous couple of hundred years, life in Europe had been pretty ghastly. There'd been the Hundred Years' War, there'd been plague, uh, bad harvests. You could say that nature, you know, if you looked at nature, you'd use some pretty rude words. Uh, and you'd be thinking, we need to, if we could find something to get the better of this nature thing, you know, life would be, would be one heck of a lot easier for us all. And so along come a whole group of thinkers and philosophers and uh, very intelligent people saying, well, we're, we're bigger than nature. Nature is separate from us and we can think of it as being less than us and we can also start to use some of the things that we're discovering to help us get the better of nature. And at this time, you've got Newton coming along who is br making brilliant steps forward in mathematics is discovering some very key laws of physics, some very heroic laws like gravity and thermodynamics and so on. Um, starting to be able to say, look, not only are we better than nature, we have the intellectual and cognitive ability to define what it is and to, to measure it and to get the better of it. And coming out of this, not long after this period, you also get a lot of mechanistic things starting to, to happen. The steam engine, uh, you know, lots of mechanical equipment and so on. So I think what, the reason I'm spending a bit of time on this is that you can see that this is where the scientific method started to get itself cemented. This is where you understood the world by taking it to pieces, by re what's called reductionism. You go down into it and you understand it by taking it apart. Um, this is where you get a dualistic sense, mind and body, they're separate from each other. Man and nature, separate from each other. Um, intellect and emotion, separate from each other. And you get mathematics confirming this, coming through with a language that seems, and mathematicians would say the language, but perhaps we need to be a bit careful about that, uh, a language that, that seems to say, Look, the universe is written in the language of mathematics. This is how we understand it. Um, so from there, the Industrial Revolution starts to take off very quickly. And so the metaphors of machines start to enter our whole way of speaking. 
uh, and the metaphors of Newtonian physics come there. Uh, terms like equilibrium and things achieving, uh, you know, steadying down all the time, these sorts of ideas. We've now had, what, 300 years of this paradigm, and it's brought us enormous benefits. I, you know, I'm, I'm not standing here saying, well, I wear two computerized hearing aids, which without them I wouldn't even be able to stand here because I couldn't even hear myself properly. So, you know, technology is fantastically beneficial. So I'm not trying to knock it. But what I am wanting to suggest is that the consequences of this way of thinking are deeply pervasive and I think the side effects are there for all of us to see in the form of the effects that it's beginning to have on the state of our planet and our, and our future. So in systems thinking we'll be looking a bit about how man as hero is not necessarily the best way of thinking about things but just before I get on to that I'd just like to give you an indication of how pervasive I think the mechanistic paradigm is. So uh, take for example um, medicine. How do we deal with the body? Uh, we essentially take it to bits. If you go to hospital, you, know, you turn left to have your heart looked at, you turn right to have your lungs looked at, you go upstairs to have your brain looked at. Uh, who in a hospital is actually looking at the whole of you at once? Um, a and E as it happens. Yeah, if you want to find the person in a hospital who understands you holistically, go to A&E, which is perhaps why everyone's going to A&E these days. But, yeah, I'm, I'm exaggerating to make a point here, but I'm not suggesting that we could do this any different because we need specialists. But by specialising, one of the things is we lose a sense, we lose a sense of the whole. Look at the way we do economics. Economics started very soon after Newton, and they came up with heroic ideas, supply and demand and... Ut uh, utilitarianism and these sorts of things. They look for heroic ideas. And actually, I think we all know economics is a very complex, almost impossible to understand set of act social activities where things emerge, things happen, tipping points ha occur. Uh, and it's not understandable in the heroic way that uh, econo classical economists would, would sometimes like just to convince us that it is. We often talk about organisations as machines, a well-oiled machine. Um, and, we, and we talk in these terms, uh, sort of organisations having structure and hierarchies and organisation charts, very mechanistic sort of models. And actually organisations tend to be rather messy conversational things where people kind of fit around each other as best they can if we describe them rather than try to define them. In agriculture, you know, we've become, we treat the land uh, as, a, as a, somewhere we can apply our chemistry set. So, you know, we've got a very mechanistic view of, of the land. We, in organic agriculture, we're trying to get back to letting the land do its, its thing and to be a self-organising, self-generating system. But in, our, in the chemistry set version of it, we spray it, we fertilise it, we just use soil as a medium for standing things up in, if you like. Um, and I think we can all begin to see the consequences of that in, in the way that uh, we grow things. And perhaps more significantly is our relationship with, with the world, with nature, that it's there for us, that we, we plunder it, as uh, I've heard people say, you know, we, we plunder nature for what it can give us. Um, and we don't put back, and we don't ask organisations to count the cost of that plundering. So they can take oil out, burn it up into the air, and they don't either pay the cost of what they've taken or the cost of the pollution. Um, and, you know, that's just one example. So we live in a rather either-or world. Um, learning, think that's, that's a chair, uh, it, it isn't anything other than a chair. We see it as a chair. Um, it has an objective reality as a chair. It doesn't matter that an ant doesn't see it as a chair or it might be seen to be something else. It has an objective reality. We take our learning from experts. Um, 
we have cemented into our systems either or kind of mechanistic practices. So our politics is very either or, people across a chamber. You're right, I'm wrong. Actually, no, they never say that, do they? You're right, you're wrong. Um, or our judicial system isn't about truth, it's about who tells the best story. Uh, two people pitching their stories against each other. Um, we have an idea that we can own land. There are, there are cultures in the world where they, they just can't even begin to think that it would be right to have an idea of owning land. The land is, you know, is, is the soul of the world. It's not something you can own, whereas we see that you can virtually every inch of the country we live in is, is owned. And you could say also that the, the prevailing worldview, the prevailing way of being in the world, is thought-based. That we're taught from a very early age that thinking, rational thinking, um, this is the way that, the right way. It's not to say that we don't use our emotions, it's not to say that we don't use our intuition, it's not to say that we don't use other ways of knowing, but we can't come into work on a Monday morning and say, oh, over the weekend I had an amazing idea and this is what we've got to do, because somebody's going to turn around to you and say, hang on a minute, hang on a minute, we need the rationale for that. Uh, and you might say, look, I know, I know this is the right thing to do, I can feel it here. You, you can't do that, can you? I bet, you know, in your organisations, you can't just sit down and say, come on, we're going to do this because I, I think it's the right thing to do. You're going to have to prove it and get your data out. You've got to go through the scientific approach. Now, I'm not saying that's wrong, but what's happened to me is that this has become the only right way. And I think that's very dangerous because I think there are other ways. And we, we need to think about whether the mechanistic paradigm, as I'm calling it, serves us in all areas uh, and whether it's complete. And that's where I want to introduce a different way of seeing the world, which is systems and systems thinking. <laughs>